got a few announcements. The first announcement, I'm Graham Huon, and I'm the chair here. Uh, the first announcement is that we've got a survey active on the website for AES looking at skills uh, of the various people who are members or non-members. And we'd be very interested in getting as many people as we can to respond to that so we can get a good sample of where the industry is at and where the industry needs to move for training. So if you know anybody or you, you yourselves are not aware, please log in, have a look at the survey, fill it out. It's not painful, but it is reasonably... So well, it's concise. It's concise. Yeah. So it's comprehensive. Concise. Comprehensive and concise. There you go. <laughs> um, so that's good. Um, I'll be talking about the session next month uh, at the end of the, the show and uh, give you a brief on that. But I'd like to focus tonight on what we're doing uh, with the design of loudspeakers. Now, where we're coming from with this is if you are a loudspeaker manufacturer or a user or anybody, what pain did the loudspeaker designers have to go through to come up with the products that you're enjoying today? One of the leaders in that field in the world, not just Australia, in the world, is Loudsoft. And Loudsoft was set up by Peter, um, and his wife is here tonight, Dorrit is here tonight. He set that company up to analyse loudspeakers and design them. Peter has worked with just about every loudspeaker company in the world. You name it, he's either been there with them working or he's been helping them design their products, occasionally finding what was wrong and fixing it, occasionally coming up with new designs, doing a lot of really good work. Um, tonight, Peter is going to describe uh, and demonstrate what goes wrong and how his product set, which he calls Fine Circle, which is a series of products to solve particular problem areas, is used and all of the loud soft support that they have behind that for training and education purposes. This is all aimed at the design and evaluation of loudspeakers, but it extends out from the drivers to the boxes, to the crossovers and the electronics. He'll be showing you how some of the tricky design problems have uh, been fixed for some of the well-known products you have. And if you get a chance after the session, you could probably ask him a, a bit about some of the problems that he wouldn't necessarily speak about publicly. So that could be interesting. Peter has been working, in the, this is the formal response, Peter has been working in the loudspeaker industry since 1974. He started with the company Seas, was chief engineer for VIFA, ScanSpeak and Dyn Audio. He then worked with JBL as a specialist tweeter designer. In 1993 he was, became an independent consultant specialising in analysis of loudspeakers. He has explored manufacturing techniques, research into new components and materials, advanced acoustic finite element modelling, new measurement methods, novel loudspeaker design concepts, and has been involved in development of several, several customised products on many private labels. So tonight I'd like to welcome Peter here, and I'm very interested to hear what he has to say, and I think you would too. So can you give him a good welcome? Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Graham. Thank you for inviting me. It's nice to be in such a new continent and talking about loudspeakers. Um, so I have some slides. I'll try and do a quick intro. Uh, this you already just heard, that I have started in 74, and I have been working with different companies. In uh, at JBL, I was called Tweeter Peter because <laughs> I worked with tweeters. Um, I managed to get an award from uh, the American Loudspeaker Manufacturing Association as a foreigner. I think that's very unique. <laughs> they don't, don't usually do that to our foreigners. Uh, so the fine circle is what we are going to, to talk a little about. Um, and... Here are some of the, for some people, well-known programs. Fine Motor is the first program we started with, which is the basic. It will help you to design the basics for the speaker, sensitivity, Q, and Xmax, and those things. 
And then we have fine cone that is real acoustic final element analysis of a loudspeaker cones and domes and all the moving parts. Uh, fine box is where we take the model from fine motor and put it in a box. Basically, we can also analyze it at high power. I'll try and give you an example of that. Uh, then we have fine crossover, which is crossover simulation using real measured responses. And I say responses because it can use off-axis responses as well. Uh, then we have the latest, which is fine DSP. Today, most speaker manufacturers make active speakers with DSP. And we have some new interesting things we can do with fine DSP, which are, I'm going to show you. Um, then uh, just a few words about fine motor. Uh, this, as you can see here, there's a lot of configurations with the magnets inside, outside, and double magnets, and ceiling, and so on. So we can do many configurations, and we can do more than that. I'll, I'll show you later on. But the basic is that we can adjust, especially the steel in, in the speaker, so that we can optimize the flux in the air gap. We can try and model it, and we can also see if the seal is saturated, and we can even model square magnet systems. Uh, used for especially for micro speakers in, in mobile phones. Um, so that's something what we can do with fine motor. Fine cone, as I said, is acoustic finite element where we have the whole uh, moving structure um, simulated with small elements and we can simulate the whole frequency response. Um, I'll come back to that. We'll see an example of that. Okay, so this is the screen from Fine DSP, and I'm going to into details about that a little later. It will deal with many responses at the same time, so you can you can actually deal with up to seven responses, measured responses at the same time, and we can uh, see how this works with the DSP bike watts. We can talk about high power, and I'll come back to that, but. There are some interesting new possibilities there. Um, the test um, suite is two programs, Fine QC and Fine R&D. The QC, of course, is for quality control. At the end of the line can be a driver, it can be a system or a headphone, anything. We can test in the line and we can do it really quickly. So that is very useful. Um, with the R&D, it's basically the same thing, it's just in a more convenient environment. And when we do this, we use the um, FFT technique, which I'm sure you know of, uh, fast Fourier transform, so that the measuring signal we convert into the time domain. And there, when you're in the time domain, we can see reflections coming up, and then we can remove them. And in this way, we can make anechoic measurements in normal rooms. It's very convenient and certainly cost-saving. Um, and you can see here that it's illustrated with a reflection. It comes reflecting from a, a, a wall or a surface, and therefore it's del delayed. And this, this is the delay we can take into account. Um, with the uh, fine R&D system, we can measure a lot of things. Uh, two small parameters, uh, harmonics, waterfall, and we can summarize curves and do quite a number of things, as you can see here, that there are uh, also RTAs and we can do polar responses. So we cover basically the, all the normal need, needs you have. Um, we are just soon releasing the new version that can sample at 192K, which you may be able to see here. But the frequency point here is, this is 100K. So we can measure up in this end here beyond 20K with um, impedance and phase and everything. Uh, and this is really nice because now we don't have the limitation of 20K or, or 30 or 40. <coughs> With this, we can also measure microphones. Maybe not so interesting for you, but 
we can actually normalize a measured response. So if you have a nice uh, speaker response, you can use that as the reference and then measure uh, different microphones. Today, that's becoming really important. A uh, few words about FineQC. Um, we test the frequency response, as you can see on, on the top, and there are uh, limits to that. We test them against. Same thing with impedance with limits, and of course we test the polarity too. But here we test Robin Bus. I will show a little one more slide about the Robin Bus. The Robin Bus is everything that the speaker does wrong uh, with sound. If there's a rubbing sound, the buzzing sound can be very faint, but it can disturb uh, the, 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 what the speaker should play. And, and we have a really good test method for that. Also, when we test a number of speakers online, um, the system will save all responses automatically. This means that then we can have very good statistics. So this is statistics of a batch of speakers and it will calculate automatically the average. And then we can use this average response to match one of the speakers that we measured. And therefore, we can find the golden average. We call it the one that matches best. And this is very much needed in speaker production. So it will do all, all this automatically. It's um, something that, that people really appreciate because it saves them a lot of time. Um, so this about the Robin bus testing is based on some Danish research uh, dated from 93 and it's basically that what you hear you cannot represent with harmonics only because some of these sounds are not harmonic and therefore you need another method which we have derived. Basically we look in the time domain for very short impulses that are way down in the signal. And they can literally be more than 80 dB down. So we're, it's very close to the noise floor of the system. And then they will show up with a red uh, line, so they're very easy to see. Uh, nowadays, we also need to test wireless speakers. And with Bluetooth, we can do that too. However, there's a delay in the, in the PC that is difficult to take into account for. So we have to the system must be able to trigger correctly with this delay in the PC, which we, does, we, we do. This is just the new hardware. Uh, we don't need to go into details, but we have multiple microphone inputs with power supply. We have um, all the A to D converters and all that there, and we have a power amplifier. So this is all you need. This can feed microphones can be fed directly into here. So it's very convenient that everything is in the box. <coughs> and it runs on USB with the PC, so it's very easy to do. Here is one example of uh, one of the QC modules that is for he testing headphones. Headphones, you can test both channels at the same time, and you can even test the difference between the two, left and right, which is very important for a headphone. And we can test Robin Buzz again for both channels. And we can test, here we can test outcoming noise, uh, noise cancelling, which is also very important today uh, that we, we can test this in third octave um, analysis as here. Um, quick word about the, the Robin Buzz setup. All these uh, 12 octave pins you can actually move up and down but it's a bit tedious so a customer asked us can't you make it automatic so that I just tell which is good and bad and we did that so you just with this button you measure some speakers that you say these are good enough that you define it they can have some uh, a little bad sound but you decide okay this is this is enough so the level you tell the program to use it's it's very convenient um, here are some of the consulting customers that uh, we have been dealing with uh, in a uh, lot in Asia uh, and uh, in US, um, even Apple and, and Bose we have been talking to, and um, Bang & Olufsen and, and others in, um, in Europe. 
we have some cooperation partners, different uh, different universities, and uh, we have the DTU Technical University in, in Copenhagen, which is very advanced acoustics. They do lots of, of uh, research and investigation, so we cooperate with them. Um, just a few of the speaker uh, uh, drivers that I have designed. I have designed the uh, Daniolo woofers that have very large voice coils. This is a 5 inch with a 3 inch voice coil. It's huge and it, it's not so easy to do. Therefore, I had to make some software to be able to do to model this, which later became fine motor. Um, this tweeter is a little interesting. It's a, a, a one inch stone tweeter, but on the rear here is a kind of transmission line, which is designed to absorb the sound coming from the rear side of the diaphragm, because we don't want any reflection there. Um, and this is the ring radiator that you may have heard of about, but made by by uh, Viva Speak and ScanSpeak and uh, Timfony today. It is fixed in the center. And it was a coincidence, uh, I came across this uh, in 1985, that a dome tweeter would not behave properly, and therefore I stuck a needle through it. <laughs> and uh, I got, simply got irritated. And then, um, <laughs> then I, f for some reason, I got uh, curious. I wonder if it will play with this needle. And um, I tried it, and it worked perfectly. Wow. Hmm. And then... I had to put it in the anico chamber and curve it. And we used the old BNK recorder and it made a straight line up to 40k. Hmm, that was strange. And I started me thinking and I found out that what I had done was actually idealizing the dome tweeter because the center point in the dome tweeter should not really move at high frequencies. So that's what I just had done. I just made a kind of ideal uh, dome tweeter or ring radiator because it radiates along the parameter. So it's a ring radiator in that sense, which we named it later on. Okay, um, some speakers. Um, I have designed d different speaker systems and um, from ranging by very small to headphones and PA and so on. Uh, just pass by, by, by that. A speaker projects in, in cars we have done too. I have done a design for a Bentley and I thought they would pick me up in a nice Bentley. They came with a small Volkswagen. <laughs> <laughs> um, one little story, case story about um, this was in 2003. Bang Olsen came to VIFA in Denmark and asked for a new design. And Bang Olsen, they're known for their special design, so they wanted a special cone design. And VIFA said, We don't think this is a good idea. Uh, we don't think it will play very good. But Bangalore said, you prove it. So they had to manufacture a tool for 30,000 US dollars that would take three months and they know, they knew that they could not use. So waste of money. But then they came to me and asked me if I could model this in with my fine cone program. And I did that in the morning and found out the response was really having a problem. And then in the afternoon, I made a new uh, design proposal for them, and that became the BioLab 3 speaker. So this was one case story that really saved a lot of money, because I didn't get paid $30,000 for it. Um, OK. Uh, we have some ideas about Loudsoft Academy, because um, we would like to have young engineers and engineers in many countries brought up to a certain acoustic level so that we can all derive from there, that we can use our, um, our skills and improve things with a basic understanding. So this is an idea we are working on with, with different universities, also in China. We hope to get, let's say, people trained to a higher level which is difficult today because young engineers, they only talk about electronics and what you can do with software. They don't talk so much about acoustics. So we hope we can influence them a little. And this is about our customers. I don't need to put 
talk about the details because I think you have seen it in in the little folder there uh, in the in inlet. So I'll pass by this and say that let's go on to um, um, uh, with DSP. I have some slides that we can see here. And let's see if we can run in the right mode. Yeah. So this is actually a um, presentation I did in China a couple of days ago. Um, and I'm talking about uh, sound power. And this I'm trying to define. Um, so what is the purpose of the crossover? And then we have some uh, examples and talk about excursion and power and and uh, hybrid, so on. Let's go and take a look at that. So what's the, the first purpose of the crossover? It is to protect the mid-range and tweeter for the low frequencies, because tweeters cannot take high power at low frequencies. They're not designed for it, and they're way too small. So that's the first job the crossover has to, to be able to do, to protect these drivers. Secondly, of course, we need to have a smooth transition uh, between the drivers so that we can have a nice frequency response. Third, we need to equalize the frequency response. I think most people forget about that because we really have two jobs. We, we need to have a crossover part, yes, but it's not done with that, and I'm going to show you why. Um, because we want to control the power response, and the off-axis responses are important for that. And then finally, we talk about uh, the real uh, power um, in the drive units and in the total system. So here are two curves from uh, Floyd Toole, um, who has done a lot of research on, on loudspeakers, uh, loudspeaker responses and listening tests. Blind listening test really has done a lot of work on this. And here are two examples of speakers that were rated fairly low and fairly high, or rather very high. And you see, it's easy to see here, on-axis response and then uh, some averaged off-axis responses up to 60 degrees. And we notice that they don't overlap. They are fairly smooth and sloping down for the off-axis responses. So apparently this is the way a good speaker should look when you measure it. Um, here are the, uh, let's say, sound power. This curve here is sound <coughs> power, which is, of course, summarized of the, the radiation. And you can see that's gently sloping down and also smooth, basically. Uh, we this is about directivity, which is more or less the inverse. Uh, let's forget about that right now. But basically, we want to see something like this, smooth sloping down curves, and not this, which is totally, uh, in, you know, overlapping. So starting with measuring responses, uh, we have, this is a two, simple two-way uh, box square. There are no rounded corners or, corners or anything. It's actually not a very good design, but nevertheless, the less, let's look at it. We measure the responses for both drivers in the same position, so we get precise timing for these two. And then we rotate the speaker around its own axis to keep the microphone there, and then we can measure some off-axis responses, as you see here. The woofer is coming up here, the white is on-axis, and then 15 degrees, and 30, and 45, and you can see they're going nicely up here, and then separating up there, because now the wavelength is comparable to the diameter of the woofer, and now it doesn't hold anymore with piston action. Um, the tweeter comes up here, and notice that it has some bumping here, and then actually coming together there, and then separating, and then again a high, high frequency, which is normal. That is, all tweeters do this more or less. Um, we can also show this as contour plots, where the, the color, the red color is higher SPL, so you can see that the woofer is becoming more directive at high frequencies. Uh, big surprise, we, we knew that already. But the thing is that the tweeter is also doing that, but differently. So 
our job is actually to to mix these two and get something really nice out of it. It's not that easy. Um, so what do we do? We start putting in a crossover, and so we can separate the, the two drivers, signal to the two drivers, and we have put in a fourth order Butterworth uh, crossover here. With DSP, you can put in eight orders, eight orders easily. There is no real good reason to do that. You get more um, cut off, yes. If you have very poor drivers, you can do it, but if you have just reasonable drivers, don't because the high order will also get more delay in the DSP. And then you get other problems with that. So fourth order is more than enough. This is what we've done here. And you can see they cross here. And the total response is well behaved. It's not bad. So we can just do a little more than that. Here we can insert, first of all, a slope in here filter, which is called a shelf filter, that will bring down this climbing response here of the woofer. And then we put in some more peak and dip filters so we can equalize the tweeter. And um, that's fine. Bear in mind that this response there of the woofer, funny enough, is almost 60 degrees higher than, than here. And that's because for the low frequencies, the, the speaker is radiating 360 degrees, 4 pi, but at high frequencies, for smaller wavelengths than the, the battle, of course, it's only radiating to one side, 2 pi, difference 6 dB. So this is a very good example. Um, okay. This is our response. Very nice. We have job done. It's flat as a rule. Maybe there's a minor problem, but it looks pretty good. And though now we also see the off-axis responses that we had incorporated in this analysis. We just didn't show them first. And here we see off-axis again, 15, 13, 45. Note, note that here all the off-axis responses are higher than the on-axis. There's really something wrong here. This will not sound good. This, in a, an, as an example, to, to illustrate the problem that only optimizing one curve is not enough. And here's what we should be doing. In this example, we have used the same responses, but now concentrated on one of them. This off-axis response which represents the 30-degree off-axis response now. So if you see, the off-axis responses fall nicely up here. There is a little problem with the on-axis. But when you consider the radiation from the, the speaker front and to the sides, all the response that is being radiated to the sides will be reflected in the walls and, and uh, ceilings. So that's very important, whereas the on-axis is actually less important in that one point, or one line actually. So this is why we think this is, this is better. And this corresponds to better to, to what Floyd Toole has said. We had used some of these optimization routines and just considering the SPL in the, in the pass band here, in the green range. Um, and then we had boosted this speaker at low frequency. This is how it actually measured directly. Uh, and you can see that it didn't reach very far in the, in the low end. And right here, the difference is that we have simply boosted it. And with DSP, it's very easy to, you can do that as much as you like. However, uh, or rather, let me show first. So at 60 hertz, we have boosted uh, 2 dB and using this Q. And we have also a second order high pass filter at 44 hertz. You can actually see it here, it's cutting down this SPL here. But you, we already agree that we don't really need this to be so loud here, because it's way down anyway. Uh, so we can safely cut out there. And there's more to gain there, which I'll show in a moment, because the excursion there can be, can be cut down, because 
we don't really get a good response, but we get much more, uh, let's say, the power rating on the system can be much higher. So this one here, the high pass filter, we can actually put in with a high Q, so the Q is 2.5, very high. So that adds to the bump here. Actually, we could, could have done it almost in this one alone, but I just choose this one also to show that we, we have a lot of freedom how, how we do this. So. Sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah? Just a question. Yeah. I just want to ask a question. How come you've swapped from a vintage design to a sealed design going into This is a vintage design, yeah. It is? This yeah. Is it is a vintage design. I was just curious why. It yeah, it, 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 it could as well have been a closed box, but in principle, yeah. Um, so now you see the contour plot of the total system, and it's certainly better than of each of the drivers, and it does m match pretty nicely. Maybe there's a little problem here, but otherwise it's not bad, especially not considering that we have a square baffle. That we have done nof nothing to round the corners or anything, but this is just to sh to be able to show you that that what we can do is sensible. Um, and here are uh, sound power curves. The blue curve is the sound power for the angle up to forty five degrees, and that response, as you can see, is pretty close to the red one, which was our target thirty degree response. So, at least up to this frequency, they're pretty close. So it proves that it's a, it's a pretty good approach to use that 30 degree response for optimization. Um, the other one is, the, the other one is uh, up to using up to 60 degrees, and there's a little deviation here. This is actually the, the point I point, uh, pointed out before. Um, but overall, we can see that the concept works that we can optimize the sound power, the radiated sound power of the speaker. And now to the uh, power input to the driver. This is what you actually saw in Finebox before. The total B, uh, response here, which is B4 like, this is the base reflex system. And um, this curve, the blue curve is ex uh, excursion voice call travel very high at low frequencies because the low frequencies the port and and uh, the air are moving out of phase that's actually what creates the fourth order slope so we don't really need this much here because it doesn't really help us but but the the driver is is heavily overloaded so we can safely take this away with a filter and therefore we indicate this line and that's that is what we should limit it. And then we can get the pass band nicely anyway. Here we can boost because the port is lowering the excursion of the woofer. So here we can afford to boost a lot. And this is indicated by the red line going up there. At this point, we don't have anything else we can do. We, we have to take a, pay attention to this point there. But then we get this curve here that we can use for setting our boost and that's precisely what we did so here again is the curve from fine box you saw that before and this we can at different frequencies we can find out exactly how many volts is needed to produce x max if we say x max is our limit for what we can tolerate it's maybe it can it, could, it can take more, but that's a, that's a, a cautious way to do it. So we can find some points that we can plot in this table here: 5.9 volts at 30 hertz, but more than 20 volts at 49 hertz. That's where we had the the dip there. So this we pl plot in, and the result we show with these triangles here. And I hope you can see, but there's a curve here, dashed red response, which is the output voltage from the amplifier calculated by the system, because we have all the data to be able to calculate it. And you can see the boost here, 
but right now it works nicely because we have put the boost there where we can we can do it safely. So this is not bad. We do the same thing for the tweeter. Put in the points there so that we are sure that we don't overload the tweeter. And in this case, you can see that we would have crossed over the tweeter much lower, but it would not have given us these curves. So here we have at least two criteria for, for setting and equalizing the crossover so that we get these good responses and don't overload the drivers. Um, okay. This is the, the base level we showed before, and right here we have 7.31 watts consumed in the, in the woofer. This is the real power that is over the terminals, uh, divided by the impedance. If we had important the impedance, we can do it very accurately then. But here, up here, we have increased the power from 11.4 watts up to 40 watts. And you can see that boost there is way too high. This won't work. We are overloading the, the woofer here, and therefore it would be nice to, to boost that much, but no, this is simply too much. So in other words, what we can use this to, is to, to set how the boost should be working dynamically. And you can set this with, with the, in the DSP circuits nowadays. You can program it. So this can give you all the how to do to to set this progressive power input to the, the low frequency boost. Right, then this is not limited to to, to hi-fi speaker design. This is the PA speaker, a typical box, uh, maybe like this, but with a 15-inch woofer and a horn. Very typical PA speaker. Um, you see that we have done it just the same way, and we get a actually a nice co control response here. Zero, 15, and then 30 degree responses. This is not bad. They could, this could have been a hi-fi speaker. And then off axis 45 degrees. Yeah, okay, it doesn't hold anymore because the 15 inch woofer cannot do that good dispersion. But the other curves are not bad. So with a, within an angle of plus minus uh, 30, this PA speaker actually works quite well, which is what the PA speakers are made for, that they should reproduce maybe a voice over a certain range truly. And this is a good example of that. <coughs> um, and, and again, the power triangles we have put in, actually we have boosted even more at very low frequencies because especially pop music nowadays it doesn't have any real low frequency it has a lot of boom around 50 hertz but not so much at 30 so and this is just the case where we were able to boost it even more um, finally uh, about DSP if we do a two way or even a three way system we need an amplifier for each driver so in a stereo system, that can go up to six amplifiers. That's a lot. So if you want to save that, you may try to use one amplifier to feed both drivers in a two-way system. But then we need to divide the signal to these two drivers. This we can do with some passive components, like here. And then use one amplifier. So this amplifier is actually the same amplifier feeding both. So when we use one amplifier, to feed two drivers. The passive components is just doing the crossover action, nothing else. Whereas we use a lot of DSP elements to equalize their response. That's a very sensible com combination because these components can be, can actually be, uh, be um, simulated in the software uh, because then you are able to even optimize these components and make maybe a small inductor that is a little cheaper. Uh, so we can actually save cost by this and do a very good job anyway. So this is a very much used um, uh, alignment uh, and, and design. So uh, conclusion, we have demonstrated that we can we can 
control the output of the speaker for sound power in a much better way with this, this process. And um, we can control the DSP by quartz by using off-axis measurements, so we can handle more than one measurement. Uh, I think I forgot to show, but the, we can also show the acoustic phase response because that's simulated all the time. We use transfer functions all over that has inherent the phase. So the phase response is coming through too. Um, and this is the way when that we can control the sound power and make a balanced design and also designing for safe power. So this was um, about uh, fine DSP. Uh, how are we doing on time? Not too bad. Okay. So let me talk about a little about uh, passive crossovers because they will, they look very much like this. Uh, yeah. So in this case, we have used. <coughs> Measure responses, actually, I have tried and used the same responses in this case. Uh, you can see. And I have seen many cases where we could optimize with fewer components. And I think, do we have time? We have three minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll, I'll bypass that then. Because we, ha we can optimize with fourth order sections with compensation. I have done that. Uh, if we have time, we can, we can show it later. Then we can set it to optimize. And then it will find the best combination and some of the components will turn out to be zero or infinite, meaning that they can be thrown away. So it determines what is the best, not if you had decided it should be fourth order. No, maybe second order is enough. But that's very interesting. The, the, the software can really help you there. So I think that's uh, what I wanted to say in the presentation, and let's see what we can have for questions. Thank you very much, Peter. Excellent. Uh, questions? I have a question to start. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? You looked at horizontal directivity with yep. those vertically arrayed devices. Do you look yep. at vertical directivity? We can do that as well. We can just measure some uh, vertical curves and also import those yep. so they can be shown. We have up to six off-axis responses we can show. So, yes, yes they can be. Taken. Okay, now questions. Hey, Mike. Tell us a bit about your cues. So, um, you said that we're looking for impulsive distortion at 80 dB down. How do you actually implement that in a noisy factory? Have you seen examples of how people do that successfully? Um, the algorithm I can't show you because it's okay. secret. Um, but we are looking at impulses, impulsive distortion, because uh, the brain is trained to, to pick this out. If you think about prehistoric uh, man walking in, in the jungle and there was a small click, it could be a tiger, it could be a danger. So therefore the brain is trained to listen for these things, small impulses, and they, they can be very far below the average SPL, but but they are important. And our system is looking for them. So it is it's filtering out in the time domain. It's filtering that out, but does it eliminate the factory noise if somebody drops Oh, something? factory noise, sorry. Yeah, so okay. I'm saying, we've got a noisy factory, and we're trying to find something at minus 80 dB down. I mean, is this speaker going into a closed box that, that's got 80 dB? Or yeah, uh, what we do you? normally is we have a test box for drivers and the microphone is sitting inside right. and it's actually very close to the driver because we, we want to be sure to have a good signal to noise ratio yeah. that will take care of it for a system you need to do the same thing have it behind the curtain and in maybe in a small booth so you don't have especially high frequency noise from mm -hmm. uh, an air gun or something yeah. so if you just protect it from that it works my so next question is I've optimized loudspeaker for a flat response and spent mm -hmm. a lot of time and money. Yeah. I need to find out that they sound worse and the distortion is actually worse because of the fact that you've probably got a bell mode resonance. Um, so would you say in your experience that um, 
sometimes it's better not to optimize the speaker response for a flat and to EQ it with a DSP can be a better sounding speaker than actually spending lots of dollars optimizing the driver for a, a what I call a sales pitch flat response. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really understand what you're, what you're saying. Yes, I really want to optimize the speaker so that it's best possible sounding with the components you have. So if, if the woofer is given, yes, let's try and optimize and get the best out of it. If it really has a bad frequency or some inferior uh, response at some frequency, yes, let's bring that down so that we can have a controlled response. It's maybe not be t entirely flat. But I do know that this region here up to beyond 1K is very important because all the harmonics in the music are there. So if you have great deviations there, then the, the, the music is not sounding right, in my experience. Yes? Yeah. Can you simulate distortion? Uh, not directly. Uh, we don't do the, the, the simulation of distortion as such, but we do design the driver so we avoid much of the distortion. That's what I can right away say. Great. Um, can the motor software analyze the eddy currents induced in shorting rings? Uh, no, yeah. not at this time. We we have thought about it, and um, there's some software that can do it fairly easy, like FEMM, which we actually use. So what you can do is you can analyze this uh, with FEM, and then import the result into fine motor. So that's how we do it today. Maybe in the future we'll try and include that too, but we don't have it right now. Right. Very early on you have a, <coughs> a database with just about every material constant you can think yeah. of. Yes, we it must do. have taken you a long time. It has, certainly, it. yeah. Where do you get the data from? Uh, customers. Customers has helped us a great deal. Also suppliers of wires and, and uh, magnets. And the, the beauty is that you can go, it's a text based uh, data base, so you can go in and add your own materials okay. very easily. Except, um, for example, if you design um, voice calls with flat wire drivers, flat wire, the flat wire can occupy more area that is available and you can have a little more conductor in the gap and a little higher B then. So high VL, but these ver these wires are very very much. Some are very flat. Some are not as flat, but have more lacquer. So all this is very individual. But you can enter it in the database, and there we really hope that people will help us there. Thank you. Can you do a transient performance simulation? Sorry, a, a transient performance simulation. So hit the speaker with an not directly in, in simulation. We do that in the measurement software, where we have measured the, or rather we calculate the impulse response from the frequency response by inverse FFT. So that's how we do it. No more questions? Um, Mike. I'm just interested personally, from a personal point of view. Yeah. Um, you've obviously visited a lot of speaker manufacturers. I, I'd like to know, you know could you actually sort of tell me how many transducer engineers would there be in a factory that turns over $10 million US? <laughs> Just him. Because usually I find there's only one or none. <laughs> Just him. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, today there are lots of electronic engineers in big companies doing, and, and we have customers, uh, even Google, they, they have our software. So all these big companies are doing speakers. And their engineers are not trained with acoustics. So we try and help them. It's not always that easy. <laughs> so that's maybe have one answer. Not many, but that <laughs> yeah. one, two, two. <laughs> maybe three. <laughs> okay, uh, no more questions. Well. I really want to thank you, Peter, and also Doric, who came along, uh, for popping down to see us on a pretty busy trip. Yeah. 
and taking the time to present to us. That's been excellent. A very good, complete picture of the problems you encounter and yeah. how you fix them. So I'd like you all to join me in thanking Peter and Doric for coming along tonight and uh, for an excellent, an excellent session.